God is good, and all, all the time. time, God is good. Yeah. You know what? God is good all by himself without us. But he relishes our praise. The Bible says that he dwells in the midst of the praises of his people. So when we praise him, he's, he's, he's happy. Amen. In fact, we might say he's happy, happy, happy. Amen? Amen. All right. Today I want to speak with you about something that is identified before you, a close pin. One close pin away. I want to use that as a title today. And I want to speak on something I think will help us better understand uh, not the world at large, but the church at large. Because there's a big body of believers, many of which we'll never come in contact with, we'll never see. By faith we are part of the family of God. The Bible teaches us very clearly that we have an inheritance that is not of this earth, an inheritance that is eternal, and we should be seeking that eternal inheritance. But sometimes we've got to connect in the natural. Sometimes we can't escape certain things about this natural world, and I think it's good that we remember that. Scripture has something to say about it. One close pin away. For most of us, all we need is two. Just keep smiling. As long as you can manage to work up a smile, the world is okay with that, the church is okay with that. But how many of you know that smile is not always accurate? That doesn't deflect the heart. But in order for us to maintain, two close pins will get us there. I like this image better because it's a man that has a lot of close pins on him. And I believe he's thinking like this, as long as it is going to help, add another one. Because if the clothespin is going to keep, help us keep it together, then we ought to be looking more like this guy. Some of us would look more like this guy. And then there are others of us, all I need is one. If I can manage to shut out the, the aroma of this world, I'll get by in life. There are some that are just that way. But I believe that this depicts the image of many, and I'm talking about in the church. This ain't working, man. This ain't working, man. And you can tell by the image that, that he is suffering. There's a whole lot bottled up, a whole lot going on, and it's about to come out. The reality is, and I, I don't mean this in a slight, but Christians are people too. Hello. Whatever you're made of, whatever's in your background, whatever uh, seed you come out of, whatever tree you fell off of, in some cases the fruit doesn't fall far, far from the tree. But in other cases the fruit can move far away. What's that saying? You can take the girl out of the country. Come on. But you can't take the country. But you can't take the country out of the girl. Works for guys, works for all of us. In fact, you can take the Christian out of the world, but in some cases you can't take the world out of the Christian. This ain't working mine. So all the close pins don't really matter, okay? He's one close pin away from losing it. What separates the believers from the unbelievers? We should ask ourselves that periodically. What separates the believers from the unbelievers? Somebody says, well, I found Jesus. Many of the unbelievers believe that they found Jesus too. They're not unbelievers because they didn't find Jesus. They just aren't observant, if we can use that word. They're not practicing. They're not doing what they ought to be doing. Somebody says, well, I know what they are. They're backsliders. Wait a minute. I don't think so. I think they're individuals that have disconnected to something that they should be connected to. The Bible teaches us that mankind, in the beginning, when God made Adam, it's in Genesis, that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And the Bible says, in the image and likeness of God created he them. Male and female. So really, if we can hear it this way, you are made in the image and likeness of God. So there's a God something in all of us, right? Mm -hmm. But we don't all believe. Why is that? I, I was 20 years old before I came to Christ. I can't tell you why I didn't come before then. But I can tell you this. I didn't know anything about God until I connected when I came at 20 years old. How close are those who trust in God to those who have snapped? There are many individuals that should be doing what they should be doing but just aren't doing. In fact, there's a television series, a show that's out, been out for a few years. It's called Snap. 
So when individuals can no longer hold it together, can't keep it together any longer, they're one close pin away, if you can hear it that way, from snapping. Anybody ever felt like you just about, don't answer that. How many truly are one close pin away? That's what I want to talk to you about today. Not necessarily judging someone or looking out at someone, but understanding that the Bible puts it into perspective. And we need to focus on that periodically. In order for us to do that, let's go to St. Mark, please. I just want two verses. St. Mark chapter 13, verses 19 and 20. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us very clearly, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So if you're not up to turning, not able to turn quickly, then that's okay too. Because if you'll see it on the board behind me, and identify with the scriptures that are there, write them down, look them up later if it works for you. St. Mark chapter 13, verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction, such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. So we're talking about a time coming when affliction is going to be so incredibly horrendous that there's no time in history that would, have met, would measure to the affliction that's coming. It says in verse 20, and except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. So it's obvious that he had to speed up the time or shorten the days, otherwise nobody's going to be saved. No flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he has chosen, he has shortened the days. So there's a purpose in God shortening the days or speeding up time, if you prefer, to identify that... Somebody, his elect, can be saved. In St. Matthew chapter 18, I want to read one verse there. <clears throat> In St. Matthew chapter 18 and verse 7, this is we're going to key in on something Jesus says. Verse 7 opens up like this, woe to the world. The word woe means serious affliction or misfortune or grief, or distress. So when you read woe in the Bible, and we're going to look at a few verses that identify this, I want you to think on its meaning, serious affliction, or misfortune, or grief, or distress. And the Lord says, woe to the world. Here's the verse. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. Now that's kind of Old English, it's, it's, it's New King James, but it identifies very clearly that nobody's going to stop offenses from coming. That's right. It must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Mm -hmm. So, more importantly, whoever it is that is carrying this offense, to create offense, to agitate, to become the one, in many ways, that is the offender. The Bible says, woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Now, that's New King James. I want us to look at the same verse in the Amplified, and this I want you to focus on. Jesus said, woe to the world for such temptations to sin and influences to do wrong. Mm, influences. Friends, the world is all about the flesh. Mm -hmm. It's all about pride. In fact, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. These things are cardinal, the worldly. That's what the world lives by. Jesus said, woe to the world for such temptations to sin and influences to do wrong. It is necessary that temptation come. Yes. So it's going, nobody can stop it. Yes. But woe to the person on whose account or by whom the temptation comes. Wow. I don't know about you, but that causes me to not want to think that I would be one of those who is an agitator. You cannot straighten a dog's back leg, but you can acknowledge it. In the image you can see the dog is bandaged in the back leg. You could point it out, 
my wife and I was having a conversation just a couple of days ago and it identified something for me concerning this portion of the message because uh, sometimes when you realize somebody's crooked, you want to watch them. Mm -hmm. Hello. If they're crooked, they're going to stay crooked. Mm -hmm. Just like a dog's hind crooked. In fact, I was a child. I was young, like maybe eight, nine years old, when I heard this for the first time. A man was talking about somebody else that was ripping folks off. And he said, they're as crooked as a dog's hind leg. Anybody ever heard that? That's an old saying. As crooked as a dog's hind leg. Why? Because every dog has a crooked hind leg. Hello? You cannot straighten a dog's back leg, but you can acknowledge it. You can point it out. 1 Corinthians, please, chapter 5. Having said a few things to lay for us a slight foundation, now we're going to commence a build. I believe it's important for us to understand the Word of God. I do not believe there is such thing as a New, Christ, New Testament Christian or even Old Testament Christian. Right. If you're a Christian, Christ-like, you're going to be Christ-like throughout the entire Bible. Yes. Because the Old Testament has some mighty powerful things to say about our Lord and Savior. The New Testament basically builds on that which is said in the Old Testament to illuminate the very one spoken of in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. In fact, John, in St. John, says uh, the light, he is the light that came into the world to illuminate every man. Yes. And I believe that his purpose is to bring light to us. So we want to understand the Word of God, Old and New Testament. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, I write unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church at Corinth in letter. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must you needs go out of the world. The only way that we're not going to be around those who are doing said things is if we leave the planet. Because in the planet... This is how the world operates. It is their modus operandi, M-O. It is what you can identify about them. Three things, right? Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, come on, and the pride of life. That's what the world operates by. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. And if you mark in your script, you might underscore this next part. If any man, I might add, or woman that is called a brother or sister, and is. I would underscore that much, and I dub the word in, or and rather, for uh, clarity. If any man or woman that is called a brother or sister is a fornicator, or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, insulting language. There are many Christians who think it's fine to cuss. The Bible says that we shouldn't do that. We should let our yes be yes and our no be no, but we should swear not. Filthy language is not really part of the character that God has given us in Christ, who is Messiah. Or a drunkard or an extortioner. With such a person, no, not to eat. Wow. Now that's pretty clear. Wow. But we have to identify that people in the world operate like that. Mm -hmm. So he says, verse 11 again, but now I have written unto you, not to keep company if any man that is called a brother is a fornicator, a covetous, or covetous, or idolater, or a railer, using insulting language, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such a person, no, not to eat. So we shouldn't even be eating with him. Verse 12. For what... Have I to do to judge them also that are without? And I dubbed in the church because he's making a separation between those who are worldly, cardinal, and of course want to be, and those who are part of the church and should be separate from that lifestyle. He says, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without the church? Do you not judge? It says, do you not judge them that are within the church? Mm -hmm. Because that's really where our concern is. Right. Friends, I'm not trying to change the world. 
I really am not. That's right. yeah. I believe that we who are Christ or who call ourselves Christian should focus on us. We should let the world see an example of what true Christianity is Amen. and then let them choose to come in. Amen. So many of us rush out to be like them. Yes. They need to rush in come on. to be like us. Yes. Verse 13. But them that are without the church, God judges. Mm -hmm. And rightly so, right? I mean, hey, God judges them. Not a, we don't need to judge them. That's right. My God, what are you going to say to somebody outside the church that they don't already know? Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Because that's really where the concern is. It's not outside, it's inside. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. In my household, when the children were small, we raised four, we had certain rules in the house, like don't throw things across the room. Now, you could toss something very gingerly. But if you're throwing something like a ball or a glass or a plate or whatever, we just didn't allow that. And if individuals did that or were caught doing that, there was penalties to pay. Because we didn't want broken windows. We didn't want somebody to get poked in the eye with something. You follow what I'm saying? So it was just a safety precaution. But the kids didn't always understand that. So naturally, one or two had to test the boundaries. I believe in the church there are many that are testing the boundaries. What they don't realize is, you cannot straighten a dog's back leg. So you and I should be pretty clear on who's testing the boundaries and who's not and who's doing what they shouldn't and who is. And we should basically see something. St. Luke chapter 17. The problem is that we walk around in, in such fear and denial that it's a long time before we ever get the courage to realize Somebody ought to say something. And by the time we realize that, we're the ones that should have said it. St. Luke, chapter 17, verse 1. Then said he unto the disciples. Now, if he's talking to disciples and being capitalized here, we're talking about Jesus. He said to his disciples, it is impossible. Would you say impossible? Impossible. The Bible says it is impossible, but that offenses will come. What does that mean? You can't stop it. Hello. You will not be able to stop offenses. He's, he's saying he's not going to stop offenses. Offenses will come. But woe unto him through whom they come. It would be better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Now, I had to look that up because I want to better understand what he's talking about. You know, we have so many uh, family units and, and individuals that are children that come into the body of Christ, and, and we take them in the back, and we give them little childhood nursery rhymes and songs, Bible stories, etc. But we don't speak to them as young people. We treat them as though they just don't get it and wouldn't understand. How many of you know that, that youth, when they are young, and I say probably between birth and uh, maybe five years old, are subject to learn anything put in front of them. They can learn multiple languages. They can learn mathematics. They can learn things that you and I take a lifetime trying to understand. Because they're able to absorb so much more in those young ages. So when they come into the church and they're five, seven, eight, nine years old, why are we talking to them in gibberish as if they were just born? Yeah. When an individual is born into the kingdom of God, the Bible teaches us that they are a babe in Christ. Mm -hmm. That means baby, okay? So when he's talking about little ones here, I think he's talking about newborns in Christ. Yes. And you could be 40 years old and be a newborn in Christ. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. You could be 14 be a newborn in Christ. The treatment of such individuals is that we shouldn't put on them an offense or lay on them some strange doctrine to cause them to believe something that's not biblical, Amen. that's not godly. Yes. And there's a judgment for those who will do such things. Yes. It would be better for him that, he, that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Not talking about children. 
talking about babes in Christ, individuals that just don't know because they haven't been in very long, haven't understood or figured it out yet. Verse 3, take heed to yourselves. If you mark in your script, you might underscore that, although I did not hear. Take heed to yourselves. So he's talking definitely among yourselves. Take notice among yourselves. Look for this among yourselves. If your brother trespassed against you, rebuke him. It's biblical to do that. If my natural brother would do something against me, I would tell him about it. In the kingdom of God, in the church, we oftentimes say, oh, well, Lord, you know. Lord, you know. Well, your brother will know if you say something. And if he repent, forgive him. That second part is equally important to the first part, and I guarantee you this, the second part will never happen except somebody do the first part. If you were not told that you were wrong, you would never repent. Hello. That's right. When I came to Christ, I was a repentant sinner. Why? Because Christ helped me realize I was a sinner. Mm -hmm. I wasn't learning that from my friends. They were doing what I was doing. <laughs> Hello. Yep. The Bible says, if your brother trespassed against you, rebuke him. That means tell him he's wrong. Tell him I hurt you. If he repent, that means he says he's sorry in genuine sorrow. What does genuine sorrow look like? The individual turns around and doesn't do it again. Hello. If they keep doing it, they're not repentant. They're not genuinely, genuinely sorrowful. They're not because they're continuing to do it. But if he is repentant, forgive him. And if he trespassed against you seven times in a day, and it is possible for him to mess up again in the same day, perhaps not in the same way. And seven times in a day turn again to you saying, I repent. And it has to be genuine. You shall forgive him. The reason the church is so sordid and messed up is we don't even tell each other when we're offended. We don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. They've already hurt yours. We just suck it up and figure we're big enough to handle that. That's not the way we were designed, folks. I don't want to live under your burden. Hello. And you don't want to live under my burden. You really don't. If I offend you and you don't tell me and you go around sorrowful and, and upset every time you see something that resembles me or think about me, you're living under my burden. You don't want that. You don't need that. You need to be free. <laughs> he whom the Son sets free. You need to be free. And the only way you're going to be free is let me know I offended you. Hello. And, and if I repent, you need to forgive me. But I guarantee you this, you won't be living under my burden once you tell me. Even if I don't repent, you still won't be living under my burden. And I won't live under yours. Amen? Because that's brotherly love. And we don't have that. We got it here among two or three of us, but we don't have it in the church at large. I mean, people hurt each other and beat each other down, and many of them aren't even repenting. Mm -hmm. You know, when somebody does repent, they don't forgive them. Hello, I, I know that's true. But if that is the case, it's not on you anymore. Mm -hmm. You told them. Let it go. Let that thing go. Mm -hmm. Verse 5. And the apostles said unto the Lord, increase our faith. If we are able to do, if we're going to be able to do what you're talking about, increase our faith. Yep. Yep. Because honestly, I don't know if that's me or not. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yeah. I don't know if that's me or not. The last thing I want to do is offend somebody. But they can offend me? Hello. I don't think so. And it's not because I'm 6'3", 300 pounds. <laughs> it's because I realize in life, we don't need to carry other people's burdens. Yes. Bible says cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. Right. If we're willing to do that, he wants to carry our burden. I guarantee you he don't want you to carry somebody else's. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> and the Lord said, If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamore tree, be you plucked up by the root, and be you planted in the sea, and it should obey you. I want to draw your attention to two words out of this entire verse. I believe what it says wholeheartedly, but I also believe that it doesn't work. 
for many people. I want to draw your attention to the verse. Verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith. So that's conditional, right? Mm -hmm. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you what? You what? You might say. Isn't that the way we live as believers? We might say something. <laughs> Sometimes something ought to be said. But we might say something. He says, you might say unto the sycamore tree. Now, we could look at that as semantics and say, you know what, you will say. Or you can say, or you should say. But that's not what it says here. It says might say. That means that it is optional on you. Yes. You got that? Okay. The rest of the verse says, Be you plucked up by the root. This is what you're telling the tree to do. Be you plucked up by the root and be you planted in the sea. And what? It should obey you. Shall obey you, will obey you, must obey you, can obey you, could obey you. It depends on what you say when you say it. Because if we go to the Lord with anything doubting in us, we're apprehensive that he would even hear us, let alone do it. And when we speak to a circumstance by faith, and we're doubting or wavering in our faith, James said, let not that man think that he's going to have anything that he asks in faith. If you ask in doubt, if you're wavering when you ask, so when you speak to the circumstance, you have to declare to it clearly. And then once your declaration is clear, it should obey you. Because it's not on you anymore. Hello. It's on God. And I believe that's the way we should live our lives. Close enough to Him that once we are obedient to do by faith what He asks of us, it's on Him. You don't hear it with me yet. Verse 7. For which of you, having a servant, plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him, by and by, when he has come in from the field, go and sit down to meet? He says, which of you will tell your servant that after they've been working all day? Go and sit down to dinner. And will not rather say unto him, this is really what you will say, Make ready wherefore I may eat, and gird yourself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drank, and afterward you shall eat and drink. Mm -hmm. Isn't that really how we treat a servant? Mm -hmm. Hello. they worked all day. You've worked all day. You come in, they're supposed to serve you. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. Are you listening to me? So, he says, this is what you really will say to them. You won't tell them, come in to eat. You'll tell them, hey, get me something together. Get yourself fixed up and then come and serve me. Because you're in charge. Verse 9. Does he think that that servant, does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? Which of you do that? Jesus is using a real example that they can understand because so many people operate under this premise. I think not. We would not thank somebody for doing what they should do. My kids used to look for that. Sometimes I felt good enough to do that. Sometimes I didn't because it was the prerequisite of the house. I'm not going to thank you for not throwing a plate through the window. But if you throw a plate through the window, I'll be after you. Hello. Because you obey or keep the rule, I'm not going to thank you for that. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. If you do what is expected of you, why should I thank you? That's just what is expected of you. It's like the whole allowance premise. Anybody know what that allowance thing is? Mm -hmm. I was raised without it. Mm -hmm. Hello. When, when I wanted money, I had to go ask for money. Otherwise, food was provided, clothing was provided, shelter was provided. You understand what I'm saying? Those things were part of me being raised in that house. Those things were provided. It wasn't an allowance for me. I had to go ask for money separately. 
because there was no allowance for the things that were provided. And when I ate at the table, I ate what was set on the table. If I didn't want to, I could put my plate aside, and when I came back, it was right there. Hello. Unless I gave it up to somebody, I had to eat the very thing that was fixed for me because that was how we operated as a family. In the kingdom of God, somehow we think we can eat what we like. We can go where we like. We can do what we like. Everything like we like. We can even bring into the kingdom what we like. <laughs> I'm backing up. We can even bring into the kingdom things we like. It doesn't work like that, does it? What does the master, what does the king require of us? Does anybody know that passage in Romans, the chapter 11, verses 1 and 2? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Twelve. It's chapter 12. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Verses 1 and 2, right? Mm -hmm. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable, reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. That, oh, that's verse 2. Mm -hmm. Got to have that too, right? And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. That's what is expected of us. Now, many people will do just what's expected, and we're going to touch on that in just a second. But by the way, when the servant does what is expected of him, we don't thank him, right? I think not, Jesus said. Verse 10. So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. He's telling that really to the church, to the people who attend the synagogue, to the people who believe they're serving God by doing the prerequisites, the very things that all are ordered to do. Why don't you look at the same verse in Amplified? It's worded the same and slightly different at the same time. Even so, on your part, this is what you should be thinking or saying, when you have done everything that was assigned and commanded you, you say, we are unworthy servants, possessing no merit, for we have not gone beyond our obligation. We have merely done what was our duty to do. Right. Friends, if we're living in the kingdom of God like that, we really don't understand the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. I believe that God is looking for somebody like Isaiah, who stood out in his day, looking for somebody. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth, looking for somebody to prove himself strong in their behalf. So he must be looking for somebody strong to prove himself strong in their behalf. Does that make sense to you? You know, we often wonder why the people who are the doers get rewarded. Because they're doing. Hello? Makes sense to me. Think about it this way. If our Lord and Creator intended to accept our least, He would not give us His best. That's right. Let's stand. You see, the real problem is that we don't understand. God being the covenant maker, and you and I walking in a covenant plan without recognizing our part of the covenant. Because God wants us not just to be, but he wants us to do and be. I've learned uh, over the, a number of years ago, not too many back, about the importance of uh, parental nurturing. When you nurture an individual in your family, you love on them because of who they are. Not because of what they are, not because of what they have become. Simply because of who they are. Mm -hmm. 
And it's possible that we should feel God loves us because of who we are. We are recognized in Him. The Bible says that, that, that through, and it's kind of worded a little differently, but through the eyes of God, looking at us through the blood of His Son, Jesus, that we are covered by grace. That the Father looking through the Son, seeing us, extends to us grace. Because he recognizes that we are his because of his son. Mm -hmm. So the son kind of clouds the vision of what we truly are to where the father only recognizes the grace of his son extended to us. So the father also extends to us grace. Go. That's good. Mm -hmm. So in him we are reconciled to the father. In him, in Christ, we are reconciled to the father. So we have position in the body of Christ because of the Son. What happens when we start to live in obedience directly to the Creator, which has a plan and purpose for us, that the Son was just part of? I believe that the Father will recognize us. The Bible teaches us that David became a man after God's own heart. How could he do that? Because he operated in the mindset that what the Father would be pleased with is the very thing that he wants to do. Amen. So many of us don't even wonder that way. That Moses became a friend of God. Moses became a friend of God. Why? The Bible teaches us that of all the individuals in the entire planet, Moses was the meekest man that ever lived. Mm -hmm. uh, that's said about him. He didn't say it. It's said about him. Mm -hmm. Well... I think meekness, I once heard, that it was strength under control. Moses managed to contain his strength, to keep it under control. In fact, if you can hear it, there's only one place that he actually messed up. And God reminded him of it. Mm -hmm. So you see, the reality of friendship with God is that it is a heavy thing. It's not to be taken lightly. Relationship with God is a heavy thing, not... Does anybody remember the sin of David? Don't say. You, you, yeah, David messed up, didn't he? Mm -hmm. David couldn't build the temple because there was blood on his hands. He was a warrior. Mm -hmm. His son was raised not really a warrior. In fact, his son was born in peacetime because of what his father had done. Mm -hmm. So Solomon could rule the kingdom without war, simply because David had taken care of all the enemies, if you can hear it that way. But David wasn't worthy to build the temple. Why wasn't he worthy to build the temple? God said because he had blood on his hands. Was it the blood of one man? Or was it the fact that he was a warrior? The Bible says because he was a warrior. It doesn't say because of the blood of one man. But David messed up. But you see, when David messed up, he realized, oh my God, I blew it. i got to do what's right now. Mm -hmm. So the Bible says he became a man after God's own heart because he repented. And when he repented, God acknowledged that. And the Bible says this of him in the New Testament. That David in his generation was perfect. Mm -hmm. I don't think a greater testimony could be said. David acknowledged God, walked with God, wrote the Psalms. Come on, somebody. David lived as king over Israel, a king after God's own heart. He was the second king, but he was God's king. The first one was the man's king. You know, God sometimes gives you what you want. It's not what you need. Trust me. So when David came along, it fixed everything. And he was able to lead the people of God. Today we need leaders that are strong enough to acknowledge things that are not right when they're not right. And careful enough to give God the glory in everything that is of God. Mm -hmm. And that's why you and I should live as a people, recognizing that we can't give Him our least, not when He's giving us His best. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank You for Your Word today. We would ask, Lord, that You speak deeply within our hearts. Stir us to a point where we will recognize we must be your people. Not our people doing it our way, but your people. That every church within itself is lost, marooned on an island, without the head of the church in operation. We would thank you that the glory that we have in Christ would be illuminated in this city among those who would we would come in contact with and truth 
what surface in our conversation and lifestyle. We give you praise in Jesus' name.